The Lord of the Rings dice building game is set in Tolkien's Middle Earth. In this game, players work together to defeat Sauron, while each is hoping to gain as many glory points as possible to compete against their fellow players. Players recruit dice and add them to their bag, each representing a character from Lord of the Rings. Players use these dice to attack and destroy Sauron's dice, which represent his various units from goblins to orcs to balrogs. Players travel together starting in the Shire and moving on through the locations of Middle-earth where the adventure takes place. To set up the game, place the Sauron mat in the middle of the table. Place the score tracker nearby and take the corruption tokens ready for play. Now you'll notice that I've added a sticker to the Sauron mat. This represents an area, an extension of the muster area. And these are dice that are mustered but have not yet been rolled. And I will explain later where the, this comes in. Each player chooses a colour from the four available and takes an empty bag of their chosen colour. They also take the score marker for their colour and places it beside the score tracker. Take the locations deck and put it on the appropriate spot on Sauron's mat with the first location face up. Choose the starting player to be the ring bearer. Normally it's the shortest player who is the ring bearer at the beginning. Each player takes a player mat and places it in front of them. You will need to have plenty of space in the middle of the table for what will be the wilds. Take the artifact deck and divide it into three piles. The heirlooms, the weapons and the elven gifts. Shuffle each pile well, and these are now ready for play. You are now ready to play. Each location card will give you some instructions which you should follow to set up the wilds at that particular location. So for location one, each player takes eight Frodo and two Sam dice in their bag. Place the basic cards in the wilds. The three basic cards in the wilds are Frodo, Sam and Bill the Pony. Whenever you place a new card in the wilds, you place its dice upon it. Normally, four dice are placed on every card that's put in the wilds, with a few exceptions. Frodo gets zero dice. Sam gets two dice. And later on, when you deal out Sauron's cards, his will get three dice each. But most cards will take four dice. You can use the symbols at the bottom of the cards to check that you have placed the correct dice on each card. Finally, for location card one, give the one ring to the starting player that you chose earlier. So now you're all set up for location one. Player order is as follows. First of all, the ring bearer takes their turn. And then each player after them takes their turn in order, going clockwise around the table. Then the ring bearer takes the turn of Sauron. Then the ring is passed to the next player in clockwise order and the next round begins. So then the new ring bearer takes their turn, 
Each other player in clockwise order takes their turn. Finally, the new ring bearer takes the turn of Sauron. The instructions for what happens during each player's turn are shown on the player mats. The instructions for Sauron's turn are shown on his player mat. On your very first turn of the game, you will initially have no units at all on your player mat. So you simply skip step one because there are no units to score. Okay, so now let's see what happens on subsequent turns of the game. And this is going to be the regular step one. Let's see what happens. The only units that are scored are those in the muster area. These will earn you a number of glory points as shown on the corresponding units card. So for example here, for Sam, the, he has one glory point as shown in the top right corner of his unit card. You then move your score marker that number of units along the score track. So you start at zero and then you move on to one to score one Sam. Then move the die that you've just scored into your used pile. Any die still remaining in the prepared area that were not used by other players in the previous round simply get moved to the used pile and score nothing. Units in this area are only scored if another player uses them. Now any Units that were previously in the muster area, but were destroyed by Sauron in the Sauron phase and, and were therefore moved to the used pile, these do not score. Likewise, any artifacts uh, do not score unless the, the rules on the cards say otherwise. During the scoring, if you have any um, artifacts in your muster area, you can optionally leave them there if you wish, or you can move them to the used pile. The choice is yours. Also, note that even if uh, a unit is corrupted by Sauron, um, it, it can still score if it was in the muster area. And that might happen if, when it was mustered, it was not corrupted, but then um, since then, it has become corrupted, it will still score. Okay, so now let's go on to step two. So shake the bag and uh, draw five dice from it. Place these dice in the active pool then roll them. And place them back in the active pool. Okay, so I've rolled three fellowship and I've got two dice I can muster. I decide whether I want to um, actually muster or alternatively I could spend the fellowship by recruiting from the wilds. And in that case I would get a new die. This symbol on the Sam die indicates that I can re-roll this plus one other die of my choice. So for example, I could choose this one and then maybe this one, and I could re-roll those two. This symbol, as shown on this Build the Pony die, enables you to immediately roll two extra die and add them to your active pool. So draw two more dice from your bag and roll them immediately. You now move this to your spent pile because you've spent it. You roll the number of dice shown by the number. So this, might, this might be one or two.
So what happens if there are not enough dice in my bag? So if I don't have five dice in the bag to roll, what I do in this case is that I just take the two dice that I do have in the bag and put them in the active pool. And then I take all of the dice in the used pile and put them in the empty bag. So this is the only time you take dice from the used pile and that's to put them into the empty bag. And then um, shuffle the dice and then draw the three remaining dice that I need to get up to five. Okay. So you just draw the number of dice that you need uh, to get up to five. And then you take those dice and you roll them. Okay. So now for step three, I will spend these two to muster these two. The cost to muster is shown in the top left corner of each die. So in this case, each one costs one to muster. So I would need to spend two fellowship to muster them, which I see here. I then immediately use these two to attack any units that are in Sauron's muster area. Even if there are no units in his muster area, I can still muster these two and I will, I will get a score for them. That will get me glory points. But let's deal with the normal situation when there are in fact units in Sauron's muster area to be attacked. The total cost of your attack is the sum of all the numbers in the top right corners of your dice in the muster area. That gives you the total attack value. Individual dice do not attack individual units. You simply sum all of the dice together to get you your total attack value. So with my total attack value of 3, I then have a look at what Sauron has in his muster area. Check the total cost of the defence power of all the dice added together. So in this case we have a total defence value of 4. So with my attack value of 3, this will successfully defeat and destroy one of these two units. That gets moved to Sauron's destroyed area. Unfortunately, it was not enough to destroy the second unit, so this remains in the muster area. Any units in the destroyed area are destroyed for the remainder of this location, unless a rule tells you otherwise. When determining my total ta attack value, I can also refer to other players' units in their prepared area. So in this case, another player has got Sam in their prepared area, so I can now use this die as part of my attack. So this gives me a total attack value of 4. As soon as I use another player's die in their prepared area, that die gets moved to their used pile and that player immediately scores one point. As an alternative to mustering your units you can instead prepare them for war. The cost is still the same, you still pay two fellowship and instead of moving them to the muster area you move them to the prepared area. These two units are now available for other players to use. You do not use them yourself to attack Sauron, but other players use them. You cannot split your units between mustering and preparing. They must either all be mustered or all be prepared. There are some advantages to uh, preparing Frodo. Um, so if you have a Frodo die in the prepared area, it actually will cancel out one of the eye symbols uh, that Sauron has when he musters them. So the more Frodo die uh, that are prepared, the, the better uh, to cancel out those eye symbols. Now you'll notice that 
Some of the dice have symbols in the bottom left corner uh, showing either one or two asterisks. So what you should do is refer to the unit card where you'll have an explanation of what that means. So here, for example, um, I've rolled a two star. But let's just have a look at the two possibilities here. So if I'd rolled a one star, if in your prepared area when scoring, each of your fellows whose scores gains plus one glory. Two stars, Army of Gondor, plus two attack if Sauron's muster area contains Haradrim. Now, the Haradrim are shown on the Return of the King um, card here. So in other words, this would give us an additional attack of plus two. So my attack here would be the sum of my three dice here, plus an additional two, if there are Haradrim in Sauron's muster area, as shown here. With artifacts, you don't need to pay any fellowship to muster these. You can simply either place them in your muster area or in your prepared area for other players to use if you wish. These get attached to particular units when they are mustered. If they don't actually get attached to them, then they just simply remain here in the muster area after all of your unit dice have been moved and scored. However, if you do attach them, then this artifact will give additional power to the unit that it is attached to. That artifact now stays with that unit until the unit is moved to the used pile. And in that case, the artifact moved, moves with it as it's scored. Artifacts give various different powers to your units. Some of them give them additional attack strength, some of them give them additional defense strength. Although it is attached to a particular unit, it, the particular power may apply to all of the units. Some artifacts just allow different things to happen that don't normally happen during the normal course of the game. For example, the Lembas allows all prepared fellows to go to your active pool instead of to your use pile when they are scored. You can spend fellowship points recruiting from the wilds. So the cost for recruiting a unit from the wilds is shown in the top left corner of the card. So Sam costs one fellowship, Build a Pony costs three fellowship. You can have a look at the card to see what the benefits of each unit are. At the bottom of each card are shown the six sides of the die that will come from recruiting. So to recruit from the wilds, choose whom you want. So for example, let's go for Sam. His cost is one. So I would spend one fellowship for Sam and I would take a Sam die from the card and place it immediately in my bag for use later on. If there are no dice left on the card, then that unit cannot be recruited. You can also recruit items. Once the location card has moved on to the Mines of Moria, there's an additional step that you need to take into account when recruiting. The first three times a dice is recruited from a particular row, then Sauron, you take one of the dice for Sauron from that same row and place it into his mustard but not yet rolled area.
Once all the dice have gone from that particular row, you can continue to recruit from the row, but no dice are moved to Sauron's areas. As an alternative to recruiting, you can instead restore a fellowship card. Fellowship cards get corrupted by Sauron and when they are corrupted, any dice thrown for this card is null and useless and so just simply can't be used. So it's good to restore the card if possible and to restore it you spend fellowship according to the fellowship cost of that particular unit and then you remove the corruption from the card. You can only restore a fellowship card if you've not done any recruitment. You then move all dice from your spent pile and active pool to your used pile. There may be dice left in your active pool that you've not actually spent. They get moved to the used pile as well. And it's, that's now the end of your turn, and the turn moves to the next player, clockwise around the table. On step 5, at the end of each subsequent turn, you will continue to move dice from your spent pile and active pool to the used pile. So this used area will continue to grow as new dice get added to it. So to start the Sauron phase, the ring bearer has a look to see how many dice there are in his muster area. This is all dice, including eyes as well as uh, units. And if any Frodo dice are in any of the player's prepared areas, these do not make any difference. Um, so you still just count the number of dice in the muster area. And this also includes uh, those that are mustered but not yet rolled. You, you don't count anything in Sauron's destroyed area or in his active pool, in fact. So everything in the mustard area. So here we have four dice, so that means we're going to have to spread four corruption. But that doesn't happen right now, that happens uh, in step three. Uh, but just for now, I'm actually going to put four uh, of these corruption markers here. Um, we're not actually going to spread all four markers, we only actually spread one in step three, but this is just handy to have as the count for how many uh, corruption, how much corruption we are going to spread. Sauron now attacks all the players with his total attack value. Ignore any dice in the mustard but not yet rolled area. Also ignore any eye symbols, unless the location card indicates that this eye symbol represents a unit. So for example, for the case of Rivendell, the eye symbol does represent a Black Rider unit, and so it would be used in the attack. But in this case, in the Mines of Moria, the eye does not represent a unit. So then, in this case, we have a, an attack value of 3. Sauron will then use this total attack force against each of the players in turn, but only against the units in the muster area. Units in the prepared area are not attacked. So then take the total attack value, in this case 3, and apply it to the units that are in the muster area. Refer to the bottom right corner of each of the unit's dice to determine its defence value. Keep in mind that if any artefacts are attached to that unit, then those artefacts may help with that unit's defence. Sauron attacks each player with the full strength of his attack force. 
Sauron attacks the player to the left of the ring bearer first and then attacks each in, in order, going clockwise around the table, finishing with the ring bearer. The player chooses which unit Sauron will attack first. So in this case, with a, a strength of three, uh, this golem unit will be destroyed. So move the destroyed dice to the spent area. If any Sau of Sauron's attack uh, remains, then he can go on and start attacking other units. If all of Sauron's attack has been used up against one unit, then no further units can be attacked by him. So in this case, the full strength of Sauron's attack was taken up by this Golem unit, so no further units in this muster area can be attacked. So in this case, with an attack force of three, because Gollum has taken the full hit of the attack, this Faramir unit is not attacked at all. Sauron goes on to the next player, with again with his full attack force. So in this case, the next player will receive the full attack of three. If a unit has been destroyed and an artifact is attached to it, then that artifact is also destroyed. Now if a Sauron unit is attacking a player's unit in their muster area, and if it is not strong enough to um, defeat it, so for example here we have an attack of three, whereas this Gandalf dice has a defense of four, um, nothing happens. So Gandalf just remains here in the muster area, and the attack is ineffective. Now here is another scenario. Um, so in this case, Gandalf has a defense value of four. Uh, Sam has a defense value of two. So the Uruk Hai could attack Sam first, who would then be destroyed, and Gandalf would not be destroyed. Alternatively, you can choose to have Gandalf be attacked first. In this case, the Uruk High would fail to attack Gandalf because he has a defense value of four, and then that would be the end of the attack. And Sam would not be attacked at all. Okay, so now we come to the step whereby we actually spread the corruption. Um, so we, we know from a earlier step that we are going to be spreading four corruption. So I'm going to put the three corruption counters back in the dish. So the way this works is that you need to um, put a corruption marker on one of the fellowship cards in the wilds and, and any remaining corruption is absorbed by the ring bearer. So the, the ring bearer has a choice here. So uh, in this case, the ring bearer is the blue player. Um, we have four corruption to spread. So let's have a look at what we have in the wilds. So we look at the fellowship value of each of the fellowship cards, whether they be units or artifacts. Um, so here we see that Sam Wise has um, one fellowship. So we could place a corruption marker on his card. And what will happen is any Sam dice will be uh, useless. So whether that be rolled by yourself, the ring bearer, or somebody else, um, those dice are going to be useless. So as soon as they're rolled, they will, be have to put, they will have to be put straight into the spent pile and cannot be used for anything at all. Okay, so that's one option, to put it on Samwise Ganji and then to absorb the rest. So what I do to absorb it, um, I would have to uh, move back my uh, marker by the remaining three points. Now I only actually had two glory points to start with, so that means I would only move it back two and put myself at zero, and the remaining um, has no effect. So that is one option. So that is one way to spread four uh, corruption. 
An alternative is just to look at some higher valued um, fellowship card in the wilds. Um, what we want to do here is just look at, for example, um, if I don't have any of those dice, I might want to um, use them. So, for example, I don't have any of these daggers, so I could just simply put the corruption on that one dagger, and that would absorb the whole of the corruption, and I would not have to move my marker back at all. Another option might be to, say, put it on Bill the Pony. That would uh, take up three of the corruption because Bill's fellowship value is three. And then I would have to move my uh, score marker back by one, the remaining. Note that only one corruption marker may be placed per turn. If absorbing corruption takes the ring bearer down to zero, then they simply... They do not go into negative, they simply absorb the remaining corruption and stay at zero. The ring bearer may not do this if they have not placed a corruption marker. So in other words, you cannot absorb more corruption points without placing a corruption marker. Only one corruption marker may be placed. So as long as the ring bearer has placed one corruption marker, they can then go into negative and absorb those corruption points. But their corruption marker remains at zero. When spreading corruption, this is where all players might lose the game. In a two-player game, if Sauron has spread corruption over six enemy cards, then the game is lost. In a three-player game, if Sauron has spread corruption over five cards, then Sauron has won and the game is over. In a four-player game, if four cards get corrupted, then the game is over, as shown here. Note that players can restore a Fellowship card during step four of their phase. Certain conditions must be satisfied before the next location card can be revealed. All units must be in Sauron's destroyed area. I units in the muster area may or may not count as units for the purposes of moving to the next location. If the location card indicates that an I corresponds to a unit, then that die is treated as a unit, so prevents the location card from moving ahead. So say for example, if the eye was all that was remaining in the muster area, then in this case, you would not be able to advance to the next location. However, we see in this case, the eye does not correspond to a unit. And so in this case, you could move to the next location card. If there are any units in this mustard area but not yet rolled, that also does not stop you moving to the next location. So, provided all those conditions have been satisfied, you then move on to the next location. When advancing to the new location, all dice in Sauron's destroyed area get moved to his active pool. Let's have a look at some examples of what happens when we move to a new location card. Rivendell. So add one heirloom, one elven gift, and one weapon card and all their dice to the wilds. So take one card from each of the three artifact decks and discard the rest of the artifact deck. These now get added to the wilds. So one heirloom, one weapon, and one elven gift. Each of them has four dice. Look, 
Look at the symbols on the bottom of the cards to know which dice to use. The heirloom dice are shown in the brown colour. The same dice are used regardless of which heirloom is used. The weapon dice are black and the elven gift dice are this purpley grey colour. So they go immediately under the three basic cards in the wild. Add Fellowship of the Ring, enemy card, and three dice to the wilds. So there are three Sauron cards, three enemy cards. Um, so choose the one which has got the text, the Fellowship of the Ring, and place that to the left of the artifacts. And add the three Fellowship of the Ring dice to it. These are the black dice with white symbols, as shown on the card. So you, wait, you take three of them, and you add them to the card. The two remaining Fellowship of the Ring dice are added to Sauron's active pool. So Sauron now has dice that he can roll. Mines of Moria. With the location card moving to the Mines of Moria, again follow the instructions on the card. So what we need to do is add six unit cards and all their dice to the wilds. Select the six unit cards at random, shuffling them, but also flipping them while you shuffle them. You might want to close your eyes while you're doing this, because you'll need to randomly flip and, sh and shuffle. Once you've finished shuffling and flipping, then deal the six cards into the wilds at random. Then reorder the cards in the wilds according to their fellowship strength. So I will put Merry and Pippin up here because they have a fellowship of three, followed by Gollum. Then I want my two fives and the six and the seven. Then add the unit dice to each of the card accordingly. Now Mary and Pippin's dice uh, are this caramel colour with white symbols. Notice that on the back of each card, so if you happen to deal Treebeard, you will actually use the same dice. And that applies to all of them. So Gollum's dice are these silvery colour with black symbols. Uh, you would use the same dice whether you had dealt Gollum or Smeagol. Faramir or Boromir's dice are this blue colour with uh, white symbols. Gandalf's dice or Gandalf the white or Gandalf the grey are this grey colour with white symbols. Aragorn or Arwen, they have these beige coloured dice with blue symbols. And then finally Eowyn and Theoden or Legolas and Gimli, they have these lime coloured dice with black symbols. Also, deal to the remaining two enemy cards for Sauron, the two towers, and then below it, the return of the king, and place three dice from the box onto each of those cards. The remaining four enemy dice stay in the box for now. The positioning of these cards is important. The Fellowship of the Ring card must be alongside the artefacts and then the two towers and the return of the king must be alongside the other cards ordered by strength of fellowship. At the bottom of each of the location cards you'll see an eye symbol and this indicates what happens when Sauron rolls an eye. If Sauron does not roll an eye this does not apply. In some cases, the location card will tell you 
to replace dice on cards with those in the box. So in this case, for example, in Helm's Deep, it says replace two of Sauron's The Fellowship of the Ring dice with two, the two towers die in Sauron's active pool. So in this case we take two of the Fellowship of the Ring dice, which are these black dice with white symbols on, and we return them to the box. Replacing them with two two towers dice, which are these black dice with orange symbols on. A similar thing happens with Pelin of Fields. In this case, we replace two of Sauron's the two towers dice with two Return of the King dice. So in this case, we would take two of the two towers dice, return them to the box, and replace them with two Return of the King enemy dice. You do not replace them from the cards. Replace them from the box. When moving to a new location, all dice in Sauron's destroyed area get moved to his active pool. In the case of Mount Doom, these dice then immediately get removed from the game and returned to the box. There is therefore no step 5 because there are no dice for Sauron to roll and ready. Play then goes on to the next active player and they then get to score any of their mustard units as normal a final time. Each player does this. This will be a very quick round because there are no dice in Sauron's areas at all. Um, so then you would, after that round, go on to the next location which would be the Great Havens. And this indicates the end of the game. Now take all of Sauron's dice. That's dice in the active pool, dice in the mustard area, including those that have not yet been rolled. Ignore any dice in the destroyed area. Take all of Sauron's dice and roll them. These now all go into the mustard area. For any eye symbols that are rolled, follow the instructions at the bottom of the location card. So in this case, we see Black Riders, level 1, attack 2, defense 3. So this eye die represents an, enemy, an additional enemy unit. In this case, for the Mines of Moria, tells me that we gain one corruption. So that's one additional corruption is added to whatever corruption uh, Sauron currently has. And in addition, you return one of Sauron's destroyed die back to the active pool. You must select the most powerful die. So in this case, I would choose this Haradrim die, and that would now go back into the active pool. In this case, for the Black Gate of Mordor, Sauron gains two additional corruption to whatever corruption he gains this turn, and also gains plus two attack for this turn. So this happens as long as uh, an eye symbol is rolled, and as long as that I remains in the muster area. Sauron musters immediately after the dice are rolled without having to spend anything. The units are similar to free people's units. The, the level is shown in the top left corner. The attack power is shown in the top right corner 
and the defence power is shown in the bottom left corner. The attack power is the power with which that unit will attack the players and the defence number corresponds to what the players will need to spend in order to attack that unit and destroy it. In this case, the I symbol corresponds to a black rider and this one therefore has a level 1 with an attack, an attack strength of 2 and a defence strength of 3. So this I we can treat as a unit in this case. That now completes Sauron's phase. The ring passes round the table clockwise to the next player. And the new round begins with that new player taking their turn. To calculate the final scores for all players, first of all you take the number of glory points shown on your score tracker. Each player then goes through their bag and any dice that they have anywhere on their player mat and counts the number of Frodo dice that there are. Each Frodo dice get, gains you one more glory point. At the start of the game, each player begins with 8 Frodo dice, but it is possible that they might lose or gain additional Frodo dice. If they have gained any additional dice, these would gain them extra glory points. Add the number of Frodo dice that you have at the end of the game to your score. And this will give you your final score for the game.